you have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Gaudio. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Anna McLeod. Dr. Anna McLeod is an assistant professor at the Centre for Extragalactic Astronomy at Durham University. Her main research interest is feedback from massive stars, and the key question she's trying to answer is, how exactly do massive stars influence their environment? Dr. McLeod uses data from the so-called integral field spectrographs like MUSE and KMOS on the Very Large Telescope in Chile for her work. Dr. Anna McLeod, welcome to the program. Thank you. Now, Dr. Looking at the Large Magellanic Cloud, or Magellanic Cloud, however it's pronounced, which is a satellite galaxy of the Milky Way, and actually seeing some detail, it still is another galaxy. And here we have an accretion disk around a giant star that you were able to measure from that distance. What, what is the sort of methodology in gathering data on something like this? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And really, it's something that has been possible only in the last couple of years because of the increased spatial resolution and sensitivity of our astronomical observatories, really. And ALMA, the array of radio telescopes that we used to detect this disk, is at the forefront of this. So ALMA stands for Atacama Large Millimeter Array, and it's literally an array of radio dishes in the Atacama Desert in, in Chile. These radio dishes can be combined, over 60 of them can be combined together. They all stare at the same source at the same time, and this really increases our power to look far into the distance in the universe. And the full array has been operational only for a couple of years. And it really, it's thanks, it's thanks to our technological advancement that this was possible. Now the star with, with the accretion disk, this is best characterized, I suppose, as a growing star. It's still in some ways in its formative years, right? That is absolutely correct. In fact, the star itself, we, we first detected it. I mean, it was known before. The star itself was known before, but the fact that it's a young star that is still growing was first clear to us in 2018 when we observed this particular region in, in the optical wavelength regime, which, as opposed to ALMA, which studies in, in the radio wavelength regime, uses visible wavelength range. And we observed this region with the MUSE instrument on the Very Large Telescope, which is also located in Chile. And what we observed in 2018 was a powerful jet that was emerging from either side of, of, of the star. Let's call, let's call these the sort of the poles of the star, if you want. And this bipolar jet that is emerging from the star really is a signpost for ongoing accretion. And accretion is that physical mechanism via which stars gather material from the surrounding accretion disk from this flattened structure of gas that is literally feeding the growth of the star. So we first detected the jet in 2018. And because we knew that there was a jet, it was clear that there was an accretion disk just because of the presence of the jet. But we could not see the accretion disk with the data we had in hand at the time, which is why we really needed this ALMA data to, to clarify the presence of the accretion disk. So we submitted an observing proposal for, for ALMA, and luckily we got time. And lo and behold, there it was, the beautiful accretion disk. Accretion disk with jets. Now that's sort of common with astronomical objects where you have these jets coming off of there where you've got a lot of material going in, but it's also going out. What's the physics of that like? In other words, what, what creates those jets? Those sort of, I don't know if it'd be relativistic in this case, but in, in some cases it is. What causes that? Yeah, that's, again, a very good question, and it's it's an active field of research, how these jets are being launched, where they are being launched from, what are the, the physical mechanisms that 
that are involved in the launching mechanism, how and to what extent are magnetic fields, for example, connected to the, the launching um, of jets. So it's, it's quite complicated. And um, again, it's an active field of research. So we don't, we don't really have a full and clear picture of how, how this works. But we do know that you know, it's, it's a combination of the conservation of energy and angular momentum of the rotating disk material that falls onto the rotating star um, and, and as a consequence of, of these conservation laws, we have, we have matter that is being um, expelled from, from the star. Now, you also pointed out correctly that this is a phenomenon that we see across a range of different scales and a range of different astrophysical objects. Think about the beautiful images of supermassive black holes at the center of massive galaxies that we have observed that also launch jets or low mass stars of you know, the mass comparable to, to our own sun, for example, as they form, they also have accretion disks and launch jets. So really on a, on a variety of different size and mass scales, the accretion physics seems to be ubiquitous. And it's amazing. So let's compare this to the ultimate accretion disk, that of a black hole, which everybody's very familiar with in pop culture movies like Interstellar and all that. You see this very active region of infalling material spiraling in and you know releasing radio and x-rays and everything else. But this is a star. And this star is, you know, young, but, you know, huge. Um, is there a difference between the accretion disk here around a star and what you would find around a black hole? Again, excellent question. So there will be some differences simply because the the central object is different. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a massive star. It's moving towards the main sequence. So it's already radiating. It already presumably has some form of stellar wind. And therefore, these outputs from the star itself will have an impact on the disk, on the disk structure, on the temperature of the disk, and so on and so forth, but also on, on the size and on the lifetime of the disk. There are, however, studies that show that the underlying physics of the accretion disk itself are independent of mass and they're independent of the type of astrophysical source that sits at, at the middle that is doing the accretion part. And that is incredibly interesting because it gives us really enormous power to study accretion physics in a variety of different, of different objects. So there are some similarities, the underlying physics, but then there are some differences clearly just because of the environmental conditions that the central source creates in its surroundings, for sure. Now, with a satellite galaxy, you're dealing with a lot less stars than you would be with something like the Milky Way, which means you have a lot less supernovas to populate it with heavier materials. Is there any way we can tell what the accretion disk, uh, what's in it? What's, what's it made of? Is it mostly just gas or is it possible that there's heavier materials there? So it, 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 will, be, it will be interstellar matter, so it's a combination of gas and dust. But think about the Magellanic Clouds as a very different type of environment when compared to the Milky Way. And the difference really lies in the dust content. And when I say Magellanic Clouds, by the way, I mean, um, you know, this, this object was observed in a large Magellanic Cloud, but then there is also another satellite galaxy, which is a little further away than the large Magellanic Cloud, which is called the Small Magellanic Cloud. <laughs> And you can see them beautifully both uh, from, from the Southern Hemisphere, if, if you get a chance to go there. They're um, visible to the naked eye and absolutely amazing, amazing to see. So the Magellanic Clouds have a lower dust content with respect to the Milky Way, and they also have a lower what we call metal content. And if you have spoken to astronomers before, you will know that everything that is heavier than hydrogen and helium we refer to as metals. 
<laughs> so, so the Magellanic clouds have a lower content of these of these metals compared to the Milky Way, and the combination of this lower metallicity and lower dust content in the LMC, the Large Magellanic Cloud, is partly cause of us being able to detect the star um, in the first place, because typically these massive stars that are still so young and still in the accretion phase are deeply embedded in their natal molecular clouds, so in, in the stuff that they're forming from, so to speak. So it's, it's really literally like a big amount of stuff that is hiding the massive star from our from our telescopes, from our optical telescopes. And that is certainly true for Milky Way objects. But in the Magellanic Clouds, because of these different environmental conditions, we were able to, to detect the star in the optical. And we can go into this a little further if you want to. Yeah, how's that work? Well, so for example, the lower metallicity leads to the stars in the Magellanic Clouds to be again, compared to stars in, in the Milky Way of comparable mass, um, the stars there to be hotter, so to have higher photon fluxes. So they, they have stronger ionizing radiation. They also have slightly weaker stellar winds because of the, the, lower, the lower metallicity. And the combination of the stronger radiation and the lower dust content, which is really what gets momentum imparted onto it by the surrounding radiation field and, and the stellar winds, have made sure that the star has been exposed from this natal cocoon of interstellar matter on much faster time scales than what we would expect for a similar source in, in, in the Milky Way, so for a similar star in the Milky Way. And that's really a very lucky happenstance for us. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, hmm, I hadn't thought about that, that, I mean, even the stars themselves are, they vary on the size of the galaxy that they're in, <laughs> with, especially with metallicity. And, you, you know, you see this cloud with all low metallicity stars, but that can't be good for planets in, in small satellite galaxies, would it? Well, I'm hesitant because this is not entirely my research field, how planets form in, in protoplanetary disk. <laughs> but yes, there will be differences. And, and this is also why this particular object is so interesting, because really it now allows us to perform an empirical study of an accretion disk and a growing young star in these different environmental conditions. We do know that massive stars are continuously being formed in the Magellanic Clouds, and we do know that as a consequence, there are accretion disks and jets. It's not like we don't know about those, but we have never actually observed, directly observed and resolved an accretion disk in an environment such as this one. And therefore, if you want a benchmark object that, for example, theorists or, or people running simulations of the formation of massive stars will want to use to understand how changing these types of parameters, like the metallicity and the dust content of the, the material the star is formed from, will have an impact on the evolutionary pathway of the star. Now, let's get into that. What is going to be the evolutionary pathway to the star? And I want to point out that this is not a system that's going to form planets. It doesn't have time, if it even had the material. So what does the future of this star look like, and how much longer is that accretion disk going to be there? So that is, again, a very good question, which we cannot fully answer with you know a number with the data that we have um, in hand at the moment. From the optical data that we have, so from the actual spectrum of the star, it does not look like the star is an O-type star. So the, the sort of hottest stars uh, and most massive stars that we, that we know of. It is more likely a B-type star. So it will live slightly longer than those more massive O-type stars. And we estimate the mass to be somewhere between 12 and 15 solar masses, depending on the method that you use to, to estimate the mass. But really, the fact that this is 
either an early type B star or a late type O star means that it will have a lifetime of up to a couple of you know mega years, so a couple of million years, which is a lot shorter than stars like our own sun, of course, which lives for you know orders of magnitude more than that. Um, and as a consequence, the the accretion disk just in terms of time scales, we'll likely not have the time to form to form any planets. But what, what is more than that, because the disk is surrounding a massive star that is outputting these enormous amounts of radiation, the disk will be literally evaporated before it can form any, any planets. So it's bad news for things that would want to co coagulate and form planets in that disk. Now, what about infrared? So is this disk detectable that way? In other words, is it you know radiating the heat it's absorbing from the star, or is it just too far away for that kind of a measurement? No, it is absolutely visible in the in the infrared. In fact, the first mass estimate that was that was done for the system was performed on Spitzer data in the infrared. Spitzer, of course, if you compare it to the James Webb Space Telescope, which is now on everybody's mind, has much lower spatial resolution. So really, these were all upper limits only that were that were obtainable. We are hoping that eventually the system HH. 1177 will be observed with the James Webb Space Telescope because we are expecting a lot of interesting emission lines coming from the star, the jet, and the accretion disk themselves. So in fact, in the near infrared with James Webb, we can observe all three of those components simultaneously, which would be hugely exciting. And with those three components, I really mean the disk, the star, and jet. And perhaps we can even start to address how that, that jet is being launched from the star itself. Crazy question. Crazy Basically. question. So we're looking at these low metallicity stars in the Magellanic Clouds. Does that give us clues on the very earliest stars, which were also obviously low metallicity in the universe? In other words, can we sort of maybe glean <laughs> some idea about these mysterious population three stars that we're looking for? Can we kind of maybe learn something about the earliest stars by looking at low metallicity stars? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, I tell you more, this is typically the selling argument that we put into proposals whenever we want to observe something in the Magellanic Clouds. You know, we, we, we say, oh, the Magellanic Clouds, they are perfect test beds to study the very early universe, but in our own galactic neighborhood, so to speak, because they're conveniently close. They're not, you know, too far away. We can resolve individual stars and they have these low metallicities. However, having said that, the metallicity in the Large Magellanic Cloud is only half the metallicity of the solar neighborhood, and it's about a quarter for the Small Magellanic Cloud. And it, that is far, far from the lowest metallicity systems or galaxies that are just a little further away. And that would be actually even better suited for that kind of argument. Let's use low metallicity nearby galaxies to infer something about the earliest stars and how those have formed. So to summarize, yes, it's a first step in the right direction, definitely, but the metal, the metal content itself of the Large Magellanic Cloud is not as low as we would wish to, to really make that comparison. I see. So it's still still not quite in the ballpark, even though it's half. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. uh, but that, that in itself is interesting because that tells you what half looks like. You can look just right next door at a completely different kind of galaxy than, than the Milky Way. And it's right there, two of them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the, the Magellanic Clouds are less massive than the Milky Way. They are dynamically interacting with each other and the Milky Way. So clearly there are a lot of interesting facts about these two galaxies that, that make them unique places to, to study star formation in the first place. 
Now, what do the nebulas look like in the Magellan Clouds? In other words, the star forming regions. Is this going to be a star forming region for a very long time or is there going to be a cutoff? So the star forming regions in the Magellanic Clouds look very much like the star forming regions in in the Milky Way. I bet that if I gave you and you didn't if you didn't know your star forming regions and I gave you an image of Theridi Doradus, which is the most massive star forming region in in the Magellanic Cloud that that we know of, I gave you another image of a galactic or of a Milky Way star forming region. You wouldn't really be able to say, oh, this is clearly in a different galaxy. So they look very much alike. The, the particular star forming region that HH 1177 has formed in is a region called N180, and it hosts uh, a series of O-type and B-type stars, as well as a couple of wolf Freyje stars. So these are stars that are almost at the end of their lifetimes, and there will probably be one or two supernovae going off there quite soon. Now, obviously, we, we only see these regions in 2D projection, so you know, we don't have the spatial, the third dimension, the depth, if you want. So in, in projection, these massive stars that are nearby the HH1177 system look like they're nearby, but um, will they be truly impacted by the surrounding Wolf Rayus stars? We can't fully answer yet. That's interesting because the Large Magellanic Cloud hosted a supernova in 1987, as I recall. And that was the closest one we've ever seen to date anyway. And it's going to produce more relatively quickly. So why the high supernova rates in a uh, dwarf galaxy like that? That you know, It depends on the, the star formation rate and the star formation efficiency really in whatever star forming region you're, you're considering. So if you have... If you have many stars of a certain mass being formed, then clearly you will have you will have more um, supernova um, events. As dwarf galaxies come, the Magellanic clouds are not too low mass, and they are also not what we call, or they're you know, not entirely dwarf starburst galaxies. Although Thirty Doradus, for example, is a starburst region. Um, as is N11, which is another fantastic star forming region in, in the large Magellanic cloud. But you know, the reason for, for these for these starbursts are are various. So you know some starbursts can be induced by dynamical interactions with with neighbor galaxies or, or um, you know nearby systems. Other starbursts are fueled by just the presence of massive amounts of gas. So you know, it really depends on on the local system that you're considering. Now, what is this star with the accretion disk? What is it destined for? Is this going to, well, of course, supernova, but is this going to uh, fall and collapse into a black hole or a neutron star? Or do we just not have enough of a constraint on the mass to, to really know yet? I am, again, I am hesitant because we don't have a full spectroscopic constraint on the mass. If it, if it is, if it is, of the mass that we suspect it is, it will it, it has it has a stand, stands a fair chance of exploding as as a supernova. Yes, eventually, but it's still growing now. <laughs> it's still growing, which is interesting in itself because you you start to wonder what does a star look like when it first ignites, you know, <laughs> and questions like that. <laughs> yeah, and what exactly happens, and could you even see it because it's probably shrouded in dust, and you know all those sorts of these sorts of questions. But yes, absolutely. I think what would be poetic is if this if this star someday goes supernova, collapses into a black hole, and then rebuilds its accretion disk. <laughs> <It ends up. laughs> well, I mean, you know, that's actually a good point. So, so massive massive stars rarely are on their own. Massive stars typically have companion stars, right? In the sense that massive stars are usually in a binary system. So unless the binary is kicked out during the supernova event, there's there's a fair chance that the star, once it has exploded and collapsed into whatever it needs to collapse to, has a companion star from which it can still accrete if you know the orbital situation allows for that, if they're close enough in together, for example. Is there any evidence for a companion star in the system? No. 
As far as we know, there is no evidence, but then again, we really would require a much higher spectral resolution to determine whether this is a spectroscopic binary system or not. I see. So that's how you tell you can't really do radial velocity or something like that to see if there's another star in orbit of red dwarf or whatever, which I would imagine would be really hard to see at that distance, right? Yeah. So the optical data that we have, the, the optical spectroscopic data that we have is from this brilliant instrument, MUSE, I mentioned earlier on the Very Large Telescope. But unfortunately, the spectral resolution is not very high. It, it performs amazingly well because of other features it has. It's an integral field spectrograph, which really is at the forefront of, of instrumentation at the minute. But, but again, yes, it does not allow us to determine whether this is a binary system or not. What is the future of research into this star? Where do you go next? And what's, what, what are the burning questions you're asking now that you know about its existence? What are the burning questions that will drive further research into the star? Yeah, so for example, one of the things that we find with this initial data set, so the combination of optical and radio data, is that the disk itself is quite stable. So we would typically expect a disk in these types of environments to perhaps show some instabilities and start to start fragmenting because of these instabilities. However, as far as we can tell, this disk is rather on the stable side. Now, we are limited by spatial and spectral resolution, so we would ideally want to use the near-infrared data, should we, should we get it, to further address that. Is the, stable, the, the stability argument valid only for the outer parts of the disk? And is it perhaps unstable in the inner parts? What does the temperature profile of the disk look like? Because again, we are limited by our spatial resolution and the temperature profile will directly feed into this stability argument. What is the lifetime of the disk, which is what you um, asked earlier, earlier. So these are all things that we would like to know, including, for example, can we put better constraints on the accretion rate and the outflow rate uh, of, of, of the jet, for example. So these are all bits and pieces of information that will allow us to further determine what the evolutionary scenario for it, for the system will look like. Red and blue shifting in the system, looking at the accretion disk and trying to characterize it, is that of any use or is it just not not really anything that you could get the resolution to try to figure out? In, in other words, can you tell the speed of the material as it goes in or is it just not there? Yeah, so that's that's exactly how we how we discovered the disk in the first place because we see red and blue shifted molecular line emission coming exactly from where we would expect the disk to be. So, so there, there are two molecules that we detect in, in the ALMA spectral setup. Both of these molecules show this red and blue shifted emission, which is classical for a rotating structure of, of this kind. Now, what you can then do is along this profile of red and blue shifted material or emission, you can fit models, kinematic models to these profiles to try and figure out what exactly the underlying kinematics look like. Is this a signature of infalling material? Is this a signature of Keplerian rotation or a combination of different kinematics? So because of this red and blue shifted emission line signature, we were able to determine that there is a disk, but there is also around the disk envelope of material that is not directly part of the accretion disk, but that is feeding the disk from the outside via infall. So there is an outer envelope onto which material is falling in further in and in eventually gets onto the disk where via Keplerian rotation it is then redistributed and it spirals in towards the star itself. 
You know, you have to wonder how early that that starts in star formation when that profile of, you know, basically a cloud, then a disk in there and then the star itself. That's I'll bet that I would imagine that that's an actually an early feature that you see in, in star formation regions. It is. Yes. Yeah, it is. And, you know, we also see at times we see um, rotating structures around entire clusters of stars that are forming. So so sometimes we see a, a very young cluster of stars inside a one of these cores of giant molecular clouds, and we see rotation around multiple stars at the same time. And then perhaps each one of these stars has its own accretion disk, but there is a rotating envelope of material that surrounds the, the entire star cluster. Interesting. Now, analogs of this. So you know what this looks like now, and you've got a, a uniquely good example to be able to study. But can you look at other structures in the rest of the Magellan Cloud or, or the other Magellan Cloud or the Milky Way and say that's the same thing going on? It's just more obscure. Is that are we at that stage yet where we can infer analogs of this system? Yes, absolutely. And that's a very, very important point. Astronomers learn a lot by comparing apples to apples, <laughs> so to speak. And this particular object, we were actually surprised to find that it is almost in all aspects very much like a its counterpart that you would find in the Milky Way. The only distinctive features of it are that it is observable in the optical, so it has emerged from its natal cocoon of material, whereas Milky Way objects of this particular kind would still be deeply embedded, like you say. Um, and the other, the other distinguishing feature is the stability of the disk, which I briefly mentioned earlier. But besides these two facts, it is basically indistinguishable um, from, from Milky Way analogs. So obviously what we would want to do now is find more of these accretion disks, um, perhaps see if we can push it as far as the small Magellanic Cloud, where the environmental conditions are different, again, with respect to the, the large Magellanic Cloud. And we can start to perform these environmental condition studies just by comparing objects that would otherwise be perfect counterparts to each other. Now, are these disks in general going to be different for different star types? Meaning if you see an accreting, you know, very young accreting star like the sun, versus a B-type giant star, is it going to be a different sort of thing? And do you expect differences, different accretion disks for different stars? Yeah, even even in as massive stars come, the accretion disks can be can be very different. So again, we are limited by the spatial resolution that we can achieve at the distance of the large Magellanic Cloud, but it seems like this, this particular disk is fairly large. It's about with an upper limit of 6,000 astronomical units in radius. Whilst there are other massive stars, even perhaps more massive than this one, that have disks that are, that are smaller in size, low mass stars, can have disks that are as small as a couple of tens of astronomical units. So disk sizes are completely different, but then also disk structures and disk temp temperatures can, can, be, can be very different. You touched upon uh, planets earlier. So we would, for example, expect for an evolved young star of the mass of our sun, for example, to perhaps have a planetary system that is forming in it if the star itself is forming in an environment that allows for planets to to be formed because obviously as we you know we know that stars form in star clusters so even if you have a low mass star that potentially can have a protoplanetary disk and form planets it might be simply too exposed too close to nearby massive stars that will eventually again do this evaporation of the disk so so accretion disks can be evaporated via external photoevaporation so by nearby other massive stars that shine onto these these 
potentially planet forming disks or via internal photo evaporation, like um, it is very likely the case with HH1177. And with internal, we mean that the photo evaporation or the evapor evaporation of the disk is being caused by the star itself, not by external stars, by other stars in the surroundings. It's just amazing the amount of variables <laughs> involved with. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, it can be a problem. <laughs> yeah, I think people will be thinking new ones for centuries. <laughs> Dr. McLeod, thank you for visiting us with us today. And I wish you great luck in this research. And thank you. When you, when you get, get more in the next paper, do come back and we'll discuss it some more. Absolutely. We shall certainly do that. So fingers crossed for a James Webb data for this object. Fingers crossed. Thank you for hosting. Fingers me. crossed. Although I think it would, I think it would be a very fine object for JWST to look into, though. It would, would just it? because it's, yeah, baby stars. You know, uh, star formation is just amazing. I agree, but I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs>